options there um, as we wind up and complete our uh, campaign. Okay, uh, we'll begin worship with our stewardship litany and let us stand. Let us pray for wisdom and courage to make stewardship a way of life with God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the spirit who makes our joy complete. Because of our faith in you, O Lord, we acknowledge you as the source of all that we have and all that we are. Help us, Lord, to place you first in our lives by becoming more focused on bringing blessings to our families and our neighbors in need. Help us, Lord, to find true source of happiness and fulfillment that we all see and that you alone can provide. Help us, Lord, to hear your call to be good stewards of all your gifts and challenge us as your disciples to put our faith into action recognizing that we have been blessed to be a blessing. Forgive us, Lord, for being afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others and for the harm we have caused, known and unknown. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Uh, we sing our gathering hymn. The grace and peace of Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead to bring everlasting hope, be with you all.
Let us pray. Righteous God, our merciful master, you own the earth and all its peoples, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The reading from 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. A word of encouragement to the faithful. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there is no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then, let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's message. Good morning. Who's ready to talk about investments? Anybody want to learn about investments this morning? <laughs> One, two, three, not it. <laughs> yeah, not always such a fun thing. Who knows what it means to invest? Anybody know what it means to invest? To get something better. To get something better. Yeah, that's a good start. Carter, you want to add to that? to put money into something and get more money back. Yep, but that's not the kind of investing we're gonna talk about today, quite. But what if we talk about investing in ourselves and investing in our times and talents? You know, a long, 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 long time ago, I used to play this instrument. Now I didn't play it very well, but I used to play it. And I had my scales memorized, and I maybe was almost close to having the Star Spangled Banner memorized. But you know what? I stopped playing this instrument in the ninth grade. The kids pulled it out of the closet a few years ago, and Riley has picked it up this fall. I can't even make a note on that. To buzz my lips, I didn't invest the time to learn how to play it properly and I didn't invest in my talent, so I lost that talent. It was taken away from me, and I, I, can't, I don't even know like how to finger a note on it, and Riley's tried to tell me, and it just doesn't stick. I haven't invested the time to make my talent better. And so Jesus tells about a similar story in the Bible today. The, a master gives his servants, he gave one five bags of gold, 
won two bags of gold and won one bag of gold, and then he left for a time. And when he came back, the first servant had doubled those five bags into ten bags, and he was well pleased with him. And the servant who he had given two bags doubled his bags into four bags. But the servant who had given one bag knew that he served a mean master. So he took that money and he buried it in a hole in the ground so that nobody would take it and nothing would happen to it. But he didn't take the time to invest it because even had he put it in the bank, he would have made interest on it, right? So the master was so upset with his lazy servant that he took that bag of money that he buried in that hole and gave it to the guy who had doubled the five bags into ten bags. And Jesus says, to those who make what they have been given better, they will be given more. So maybe had I spent more time with this trumpet and worked harder on my talents and invested time into myself... Maybe I could be playing it for you today, but that didn't happen. I lost that gift. Sometimes we may think God hasn't given us much talent or that we may think we have to hide our talent. But if we invest in our talents, we will be given more. Will you guys, do you have a question? Okay. You heard the story with farmer and seeds? Yeah, there may be something a little similar. I invite you guys to join me in prayer, and the congregation may follow along. Dear God, help us be faithful in using our gifts to show others how wonderful you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can join us upstairs. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have done been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. 
Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was with my, my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to you, all who those who have, more will be given, and they will have with, um, with abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, you risked everything for us. Empower us to take risks for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Anyone here ever climbed a mountain? Any mountain climbers? Oh, okay. okay I see we have a few. Okay, that's good to see. Um, I climbed a mountain once. I, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't as though I had the ropes and the, and the gear and, and everything else. It was more of like a hike. Uh, but I did climb a mountain and went to the top of the mountain. It's called Table Mountain, and it's three miles west of the Grand Teton in Wyoming. And it's, like I say, it's not so much of a mountain climb as it is a day hike. 11 miles round trip, and you climb 4,000 feet. There's a large boulder field on the final approach, and the final climb to the table top to 11,300 feet is one that doesn't require any special mountain climbing equipment. But when you get up there, the view of the Tetons is spectacular. Now this is a hike that requires some stamina, but there's not a lot of risk. Perhaps twisting your ankle while walking over that boulder field, but otherwise a very safe way to spend your day. Not so with full-blown mountain climbing. Mountain climbers carry ropes and use pitons and metal chocks in which they replace, in which they place carabiners which hold the rope that is attached to a harness and will hold a climber if he or she falls. Still pretty risky when you're climbing a mountain like the Eiger, whose north face is thousands of feet of vertical climbing. Many climbers have died attempting this climb. Now, if you think that's a risky, if you think that's risky, consider a different kind of climber, which, what is sometimes called a free climber, a free climber. A free climber is one that climbs without any kind of rope or protection of any kind. A free climber relies only on the strength of his or her fingers hands, arms, and legs. Perhaps the most amazing practitioner of this sport is Alex Honnold. Alex Honnold holds the world's record for climbing Half Dome, a 2,000-foot vertical cliff in Yosemite National Park in under three hours with no protection whatsoever. And he did this in 2011. Now, when you do that kind of climbing, once you start going up, there's no turning back. No turning back. The only way to go is up. But there was a greater challenge and risk for Alex. He was determined to become the first person ever to free climb El Capitan, also in Yosemite. In 2017, he completed the 2,900-foot climb in three hours, 56 minutes. 
And on June 6, 2018, the next year, Honold teamed up with another free climber, Tommy Caldwell, to break the speed record for a route called, called the Nose on El Capitan in Yosemite. They completed that approximately 3,000 foot vertical route in one hour and 58 minutes and seven seconds, becoming the first climbers to complete the route in under two hours. How about you? Are you a risk taker? How big of a risk are you willing to take? In today's gospel text, Jesus tells a parable about a man who was going on a journey. And as he tells the story, we see that it is a story about taking risks. Before going on that journey, the man, obviously very wealthy, called his servants and entrusted huge amounts of wealth to them. The text speaks in terms of talents. Uh, I understand that one talent was equal to about 20 years worth of daily wages. And so do the math. To the first servant, he gave five talents, or a hundred years worth of wages. To another, two talents, 40 years of wages. And to the third, one talent, 20 years of wages. He gave to each of the servants, says Jesus, according to his ability. And then the wealthy man went on his journey. Well, we know the story. We've just heard it read from, from the gospel text. The man who received five talents went at once and put his money to work, gained five talents more. I don't know where or how he got that kind of a return. Uh, I'd like to know who his financial advisor was. So also with the, with the one with who had been given two talents, he gained two more. But the man who had received one talent dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money in the ground. Now, this, I understand, was quite a quite common practice in that part of the world, as there was no such thing as the FDIC back then. You may remember a man in another of Jesus' parables who is digging in a field and finds a treasure buried there. This may well have been some person's life savings that he had buried in that field and never retrieved. Maybe he forgot where the burying place was, or maybe he died or moved away or forgot about it. Who knows? Well, after some time, the master returned to settle his accounts. The man who had received five talents went first. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. Master, of course, delighted. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who was given two talents came. Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've given two more. And the second man with two talents gets the same affirmation from the master received by the first. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the man who had received one talent came. You can almost see him approaching the master timidly, looking down at the ground, afraid of looking his master in the eye. Master, he sort of mumbles, I, I knew you were a hard man, a harvesting where you have not sown and a gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was um, uh, afraid and, um, uh, and, and I went out and um, I hid your gold in the ground. Um, see, here, here is what belongs to you. Now, let me pause here. If you had never heard this parable before, how would you expect the master to feel? He had entrusted his wealth to his three servants. Two of them had not only protected that with which they had been entrusted, but they had doubled it. Now this third servant is asked to account for his stewardship, and he is forced to announce that he had buried his master's wealth in the ground and had not added an ounce to what he had been given. If you had been his boss, how would you feel? Disappointed? Frustrated? Perhaps even angry? Probably all of the above. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. 
So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is quite a remarkable parable. So many of Jesus' parables come from real-life situations. They, they are designed to make us think. And certainly this parable gives us a lot to think about. The text uses the word talent, which referred to money, but for us ref refers to the abilities that God gave each of us. And so this parable has something to say about how we use the abilities that God has given us. This text is a stewardship text. And so it's appropriate that we address it and hear it on this final Sunday of our stewardship campaign. Now, the parable also seems to say something positive about work. The first two worked to increase their talents, but the parable describes the third as lazy. But what I'd like to focus on today is what the parable seems to be saying about taking risks. And what I understand the parable to be telling us is this. When it comes to the kind of lifestyle that Jesus calls us to live as it relates to the kingdom, Jesus calls us to live a risky lifestyle. For many centuries on the Brittany coast of France, there was a Roman Catholic abbey called Our Lady of the Risk. Now, why would they choose such a name? Now, Our Lady of the Risk refers to the Virgin Mary, refers to Mary. So why did they choose that name? Because they appreciated the enormous risk taken by Mary when she agreed to be the mother of Jesus. This Jewish teenager lived in a society that, that at worst would stone an unmarried pregnant woman and at best would shun her. And nevertheless, she was willing to risk it for her Lord and her God. Now, Jesus never said that the kingdom of God was like a man reclining in an easy chair. You won't find that parable in the Bible, in the New Testament. Rather, Jesus compared the kingdom to one willing to take risks in the marketplace of life. In the twin parables of the buried treasure and the pearl of great price, Jesus urged the necessity of risk-taking for the sake of the church and the kingdom. A risky lifestyle is still required of us as Christians. Think about some of the risks this congregation has taken. Ground for this church building was broken on in August of 1928, over 95 years ago. And construction began. But then came the stock market crash of 1929, and construction ground to a crawl. All the parsonage and parish house were completed by 1931. And many members doubted the church would be completed in their lifetime. But some were believers that construction could be completed and published a pamphlet entitled, All Things Are Possible, which detailed a strategy for completing and financing the construction of this space. It was a risky move, but it worked, and this space was dedicated on October 5th, 1941. A risky lifestyle is not only a corporate challenge, but also a personal one. By a risky lifestyle, I don't mean that we should all go out and try and climb Half Dome in Yosemite without protection, or even with protection for that matter. But there are things that we can do. It may be something as simple as standing up for what we believe and being willing to risk ridicule or worse for our beliefs. Or it may be a complete change of lifestyle. One group of people that come to mind are our second career pastors. In many cases, these are people who have had successful careers in other areas, but feeling the call to ministry have left everything behind to answer that call. My brother Phil was one who did that. He worked for 13 years as a forester for the United States Forest Service in Idaho, 
and Utah. But then at the age of 38, he resigned his job and he went to seminary for four years and then served as a pastor for 26 years before retiring several years ago. What keeps us from living a risky lifestyle? The first answer that comes to mind is fear. The third servant in our parable who took his master's gold and buried in the ground did so because he was afraid. And that's a common experience, fear. I wonder how many of us fail to be the people of God, the people God has called us to be because we are afraid. Let's face it, some of us are afraid of what other people will think of us. That often happens when we're young. We may do things that we know we shouldn't do because we want to fit in. We want to be cool. But it doesn't stop with our teen years. As we get older, our witness may become weak because we don't want our friends to think, low, think less of us or think that maybe we're just maybe too religious. Some of us are cowards for Jesus. Mark Twain once said, It is curious that physical courage should be so common in the world and moral courage so rare. A rap singer is in an interesting way of expressing it. He has updated some of the advice given by the book of Ecclesiastes to add these lines. There's a time to speak up and a time to shut up. There's a time to hunker down and a time to go downtown. There's a time to talk and a time to walk. There's a time to be mellow and a time not to be yellow. <laughs> well, he's right. <laughs> There's a time not to be yellow. The third servant who took his master's gold and buried it in the ground was yellow. He was a coward. He buried his master's wealth because he was afraid. Another factor that keeps us from living a risky lifestyle is that we have a misunderstanding of the kind of God we really have. We may be like the one talent man who made it clear that he was afraid of his master. I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seeds. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Is there any place in this parable that indicates his master was a hard man? He appears to be a very generous and trusting man. He entrusted his servants with a considerable amount of money. Uh, maybe about our, in, 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 our, in our time, maybe about $4 million. When two of the servants doubled their money, he praised them lavishly. Well done, good and faithful service. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. But this servant was afraid of his master. Why? We don't know. But it happens. I've met people who, for some reason or another, are afraid of God. They serve a God of vengeance and punishment. They distrust God because they... Uh, because they, and, and they don't trust other people or life in general. They don't even trust themselves. This makes it next to impossible to live a risky lifestyle. As followers of Jesus, we are able to live a risky lifestyle because we live by faith and not by fear. Following Jesus means trusting God, and we understand God as the first two servants did, as one who has entrusted us with much and challenged us to use what God has given us to do great things for God. Following Jesus means seeking to hear the master say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because when it comes to faith, we have been willing to do great things for God. And surely, it involves risk. Every great advance in life does. But the rewards are incredible. How about us? May God give us the strength that we need to live a risky lifestyle. Amen.
confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. It's on the top of page 7. our breath and life as we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Gracious God, you give talents and gifts to all your people, and you equip the church to serve. Turn us from fear and self-serving ways that we use our talents to glorify you and encourage our neighbor. Hear us, O God. You call us to honesty and integrity. Instill these values in the hearts of all nations and their leaders. Free any who are oppressed, expose all corruption, and bring redemption to victims of injustice. Hear us, O God. You teach us to count our days so that we may gain a wise heart. Where there is sickness or sorrow, bring healing. And where there is loneliness, Reveal your love and community. We remember especially those who are, in this, who are in need of your care right now, especially Sarah, Richard, Norm, Peggy, Trenton, Connie, Dick, and those who need, we name now in our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious God, you are faithful in all generations. For the promise of life and rest and for the witness of those who have died in faith, we praise your goodness. Hear us, O God. We offer our spoken prayers in those held in our hearts, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share a greeting of peace with those around you. At this time, we'll receive our offering.
Let us pray. God of all goodness, generations have turned to you, gathered around your table, and shared your abundant blessings. Number us among them that as we gather these gifts from your abundance and give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon your very self and care for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and servant. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you send to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering and preached to preach good news to the poor and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he given thanks, he gave for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection and ascension we await his coming in glory pour out your holy spirit that by this holy communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your son jesus christ our lord through him with him in him in the unity of the holy spirit all glory and honor is yours almighty father now and forever amen lord remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray our father who art in heaven Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There is a place for you at the banquet. Come and feast at Jesus' table. You may be seated. If there are those of you who are receiving the prepared elements in the pew, I would invite you to make them ready at this time. And when you, after you have done so, um, take and eat the body of Christ, take and drink the blood of Christ.
Jesus Christ in his holy and precious blood strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal, you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey. Strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children and give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign Savior and Spirit, be with you today and always. Amen. We sing our sending hymn. Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.